uh, carry out a suicide bombing against U.S. forces. And in the middle of the night on February 10th, uh, a unit from the Joint Special Operations Command, which is the most elite, it's like the all-star team of special operations forces, was sent to this mud brick compound where multiple generations of a family uh, lived within a, about a one block radius. And their job was to, uh, to take down this suicide bomber, uh, this person who was preparing as a suicide bomber. And so when the, uh, when the US Special Ops Forces uh, secured the perimeter and then began to scale the walls, uh, what was happening inside is that they could hear, the US soldiers could hear there was music and there was some form of a celebration. And their intelligence would have been consistent with that because they were told that someone was going to be uh, being prepared to go off and be a, a suicide bomber. However, if they understood Pashtun culture, they would know that in Taliban areas, music is forbidden. Uh, those kinds of parties are forbidden. So that should have been the first indicator that something wasn't right there. But, but it appeared to them, based on their outsider understanding, that there was a party, and they'd been told that it was a party to prepare a suicide bomber. So they start to position snipers on various positions on the mud brick wall. And one of the men of the house heard a rustling outside, and he thought that there were, uh, that there were thieves coming, or that it was the Taliban coming to their house to go after them because they were playing the music. So he steps outside and was immediately sniper shot in the head. Uh, just boom, point blank, center of the head, shot. Uh, another guy ran out to, to see what had happened to him. He also was shot. At the end of it, three women were shot also, two of whom were pregnant, uh, all of them killed. When the US forces then went into the home, they tied everyone else up, they separated the men from the women, and they rendered, or they took prisoner, uh, all of the men. They hooded them, they zip tied them, they put them on choppers, and they flew them to a different province. And then, according to uh, eyewitnesses and uh, Afghan police sources who did a forensic investigation, the US forces dug the bullets out of the bodies of the women. Um, and they attempted to cover up the fact that they had killed them. And when they gave their after action report to their direct supervisors, they told them that they had come across an honor killing and that the women had been bound and gagged and shot execution style by the Taliban. And that was the original story that was put up the US chain of command. And it wouldn't have been investigated but for uh, a journalist named Jerome Starkey of the Times of London, who went down there and investigated it and got a hold of a United Nations report, the Afghan police report. And Jerome Starkey of the Times of London reported uh, that, in fact, the US, had, the US forces had shot these people, that they weren't Taliban, and that they had attempted to cover it up. The immediate response at the time, General Stanley McChrystal was the commander of US forces in Afghanistan, <laughs> was to say that that was a lie um, and, and to defend the official version of events. But because of the persistence of journalists and human rights organizations, General McChrystal was forced to admit finally the truth, uh, that those people had in fact been shot by US Special Operations Forces and that it was the result of bad intelligence. When I went and met with the survivors of that raid, I interviewed almost in a forensic way every single person that survived that raid. We spent hours taking testimony from each of them. As an American, what was shocking to me, and I didn't know this part of the story uh, until I went there myself, the father of the first man that was shot, when we arrived, we had tea in his home, he laid out on his floor inside of his very humble mud brick house he laid out all of these documents and photos. And, as we, and we didn't know what they were, and no, he wasn't explaining it, he was just going like this, like go and look at them. And we walked around them. And the man who had been shot, and we saw the pictures of his dead body, was in a military uniform in the pictures. And he was with American troops, with his arms around them in the pictures. And he had certificates saying that he was trained by a US private military company called Military Professional Resources Incorporated. And he had a certificate from the United States uh, military in Afghanistan congratulating him on completing training courses. He was the senior police commander in that town. The person that was killed by the US Special Operations Forces that night was in fact their friend, who was a commander for the Afghan National Police in a very dangerous area. He wasn't even a Pashtun, the ethnic group 
that dominates the Taliban. He was clearly set up by someone. That's happening all over Afghanistan. And what we know about that incident was that people who had a grudge against this police commander, they could have been Taliban themselves, on separate days went to the Americans and said, these people are Taliban. And then another day, these people are Taliban. And another day, these people are Taliban. And then they know that they're going to be having a celebration because number one, they're not Pashtun. And number two, what they were celebrating that night was the naming ceremony of a newborn baby. That's, the cel that's what the celebration was about. The other man that was killed was a prosecutor who worked for the Afghan government of Hamid Karzai, the US-backed president. That was the family that was killed that night. <coughs> Those were the pregnant women that were killed that night, spouses of police commanders and prosecutors. How easy it was for, for us to send our most elite forces that we have, Navy SEALs, Team Six, to go and essentially assassinate someone on horrible intelligence, and then what they did when they, in the moment is they froze and they, they tried to cover it up. And eventually the truth came out. But how many times does the truth not come out? When I interviewed then members of JSOC, of the Joint Special Operations Command, and asked them what will happen to the guys that do that, they said, they said nothing will happen to them because it's not their fault. They were acting on intelligence that they were told put them in the presence of a dangerous suicide bomber supported by the Taliban. I'll, I'll leave that to, to sit with all of you for a while to think of how that should be handled, who should be accountable. I, I'm, I'm telling you that story for this reason. This is happening constantly in Afghanistan. And when, when, at the end of my time with that family there, as I talked to the surviving members, one of the men of the family said to me, we loved the Americans when they came here, and we cooperated with the Americans. My brother was a police commander. My other brother was a prosecutor. We loved America. Now, I want to be a suicide bomber and kill Americans. I want to kill Americans, is what he told to us. When, when Admiral McRaven, the commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, went to that village to apologize, <coughs> this is an incredible moment. The commander of the most elite force in the US military, a secretive man who is running the most sensitive targeted killing operations going on around the globe, went to that village to apologize to the family. He brought them two sheep as an as, as act of reconciliation to be slaughtered. And there was a big story that was done about it. Admiral McRaven apologized to them, and they accepted the apology. When I asked them about that, they said that they wanted to assassinate Admiral McRaven when he went there, and that their local imam told them not to. They were going to stab him to death when he came into their house. And the local imam told them not to. He said, give them a typical Afghan greeting. And that's what they did. And I said, what happened to the sheep that, that were supposed to be slaughtered? He said, we wanted nothing to do with those sheep. We let them run off. Those people, are, they despise the American presence now. And they were on the side of the United States before that. That's one of like five or six night raids that I went and investigated where the people that were killed had nothing to do with the Taliban. They were illiterate farmers minding their own business. And someone who had a grudge against them, stole, someone had stolen a sheep or someone messed up another person's marriage, or someone wouldn't allow their son to marry someone else's daughter, or whatever the reason was. And then they went to it and they said, hey, we can get the Americans to kill them if we just say that they're Taliban. So this is happening all the time. What, what, the war that we're in now in Afghanistan is largely a war against mid-level to low-level Taliban commanders and farmers. That's who we're killing now in Afghanistan. Because the whole leadership's been killed already. There's no Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan anymore. There's 100 at best, and that's a two-year-old estimate from General James Jones. There might be 20 of them in Afghanistan. They're in Pakistan, they're in Yemen, they're in countries that the US is backing right now. Why do we have over 100,000 US troops there getting blown up, getting shot at? What are we going to achieve there? You know that 90% of, uh, of men over the age of 18 in the Taliban areas of Afghanistan have never heard of 9-11? 90, I'm going to repeat it, 90%, it's actually, I think, 92%. 90% of, of Afghan men in areas of, of Afghanistan controlled by the Taliban have never heard of 9-11. That means they have no clue why the United States is there. Most of them have never heard of Osama bin Laden. They have no clue. Some of them think it's the Soviets that are back again. They don't even know it's the Americans. Now, you might say, well, that's crazy. How could you not know about 9-11? Read about the Taliban. No media allowed there. There were no televisions, no radios, no newspapers, nothing. How would they have ever heard? 
They live in, their, in the four walls of their compound, and if they need something, an emissary from the family goes. They live literally in the middle of nowhere. So if the people that you're fighting against or whose hearts and minds you're trying to win have no clue why you're there, either you're going to have to organize mass drive-in movie screenings of the Twin Towers being blown up, or you have to rethink your strategy. And even if you do tell them about 9-11, why should they even care? And as far as they're concerned, they had nothing to do with it. They were just <coughs> farmers minding their own business. So, so the reason I'm saying this to you is we are in a war that we that will never, ever, ever be won. And we are spending $9 billion every month fighting that war. US soldiers dying, inadequate armor, being blown up by IEDs, civilians that are being killed because someone else gave false information about them, now are actually becoming enemies. Now the first thing they heard about America is, we thought it was the Russians who killed my pregnant wife, but it actually was the Americans. You see, we're, we're creating terrorism in our own policies by giving a motivation to people that wouldn't have had any motivation to kill us before. And why don't we hear about this? Why isn't it discussed? Why, is it, why aren't there congressional hearings on this stuff? Because the Congress people go on the dog and pony show. They don't go and talk to those folks. General McChrystal himself admitted that this, that this happened. He knew the damage that it caused. He even said himself at one point, we're killing a tremendous number of people that have done nothing. It's not that he's anti-war, it's that he's pro-common sense. He, understand, he understands what's happening. If you follow some of what he's saying, now that he's no longer, you know the General McChrystal story, he was the one brought down by the Rolling Stone article. But General McChrystal has been saying, this strategy isn't working. And yet what we've seen the Obama administration do is to double down on some of the worst policies of the Bush administration. We're engaged in a, in a sort of special forces war of attrition, where we think we're just gonna be able to kill our way out of the problem. Yemen, as I talked about at the beginning, is a perfect example of it. We make that country addicted to our military aid and do nothing to support the civilian infrastructure. And it would take literally pennies on the dollar to what we spent on the military. Yemen is going to literally run out of water. It's the poorest country in the Arab world. And, and the money that we've given to them over the past decade is almost entirely to buy weapons. So we were fueling this. Our support for the Saudis when they invade Bahrain to support the crackdown against the pro-democracy or anti-regime protesters there. We're sending messages around the world that we're not actually serious about the business of changing these dictatorships for the good in that region, but actually making the problem worse by giving a reason for being or a motivation to some of those that want to actually do harm to Americans or, or others. The bloodshed happening in Syria as we speak is, is, is unconscionable. People being gunned down in the streets, and yet what's the US response on Syria? Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, is a reformer, is what Secretary Clinton said recently. We get in bed with these people, and then when they show their true colors, we stay in bed with them. That's a huge problem of US foreign policy for 100 years. The other thing that I wanted to mention about when I said the Obama administration doubled down on some of the worst policies of the Bush administration is this issue of, it's not just Blackwater, privatization of war. <coughs> I want to back up and kind of just give you a little bit of the history of how we got to where we are, where there are actually more private contractors as they're called, in Afghanistan right now than there are uniformed members of, of the United States military. In the 1990s, when Bill Clinton was president, uh, Dick Cheney was running his co co company called Halliburton. And Democrats and liberals love to talk about Dick Cheney and Halliburton. Oh, Dick Cheney and Halliburton, and Dick Cheney gave Halliburton all these contracts. You know that Dick Cheney was running Halliburton when Bill Clinton was president. Who do you think gave Dick Cheney all those contracts at Halliburton? <coughs> it was Bill Clinton, a Democrat. This privatization has been bipartisan for a long time. President Clinton actually created the program within the US State Department that made Blackwater's existence possible. Blackwater got its license to operate under Democrat Bill Clinton's administration. So th this isn't about Bush and the neocons. That's not the entirety of the story. Oh, they put the whole thing on steroids. But this started under President Clinton. On 9-11, the President Bush decided that they were going to just declare war on the world. That's why they called it the Global War on, on Terrorism. And they started to, to list off all the countries they wanted to go into. And they knew that they wouldn't be able to build an actual coalition of willing nations. So what they did is they built a coalition of billing corporations that could then be used to hire an army to fight these wars alongside the United States military. 
So when the, when the U.S. forces went into Iraq in 2003, they brought with them the largest army of private contractors ever deployed in a war zone in history. Uh, and some of them were unarmed contractors that worked for Halliburton or Fleur or Bechtel, or they were women from Nepal that would serve food or guys from the Philippines that would clean up mess halls uh, or engineers from Alabama that would build you know, Comex boxes and set up tents and camps and other things, build operating bases. But 20 to 30,000 of them were armed private mercenaries, soldiers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and this was intentional because if you don't have to deal with the prickly parliamentary procedures of Europe in order to get them to donate their soldiers to what was largely perceived as Bush's war, um, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go and you're going to hire an army of mercenaries. And it's something that's played out through history. So instead of getting the Chilean government to agree to send their soldiers to Iraq to fight in Bush's war, they go and they send Blackwater down to Chile to instead hire Chilean commandos, some of whom had worked for Augusto Pinochet, and then deploy them in a war that their own government is against and opposed at the UN Security Council when it was voted on or, and when it was discussed. That's, that's the model that was set up in the early stages of the war on terror, was to use these private forces as a way of turning the entire world into a recruiting ground to hire private soldiers to fight a war that even their home government is opposed to. Blackwater is a company that probably owes its incredible success and probably its demise uh, to the Bush administration and to 9-11. Prior to 9-11, Blackwater was nothing more than 5,000 acres of land in the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina where there was a mock high school uh, that was set up to train law enforcement to deal with school violence. After the Columbine shooting, Blackwater built a, um, a, a mock high school called Are You Ready High on their compound, the letter R, the letter U. And they invited law enforcement from around the country to come and train in how to face down against the violent youth of America's schools. Um, in 2000, after the USS Cole was bombed uh, off the coast of Yemen, 12 sailors died and 30 others were wounded. Uh, the Navy gave Blackwater a $35 million contract to train sailors uh, and, and how to protect their ships and vessels from those kinds of, of, uh, of asymmetric attacks. Um, but then after 9-11, uh, Eric Prince, the owner of Blackwater, was on Fox News and he said to Bill O'Reilly, I was starting to get cynical about how seriously people take the business of security, now my phone is ringing off the hook. And Eric Prince, this owner of Blackwater, is a fascinating character. He comes from a, a massively powerful family in Michigan. His um, father was one of the major bankrollers of the rise of the Republican Revolution in the 90s that brought Newt Gingrich and the Contract of America to power. Uh, they also were significant bankrollers of the, what, what became known as the radical religious right in the United States. Um, but despite the fact that he came from a billionaire family, this guy decided he wanted to be in the United States military, which not a lot of children of billionaires decide that they want to go into, uh, into the military. And he, he actually was, uh, was uh, in a, on a Navy SEAL team and participated in operations in Haiti, the Mediterranean, and Bosnia. Um, and when his, his wife died of cancer in the 90s, he left the Navy and he um, took his share of the family fortune and started Blackwater with it. And, and his vision was to sort of uh, have a, a dual purpose of a sportsman's paradise and, uh, and a training center that would specialize in training special operations forces. After 9-11, though, uh, when he said the phone was ringing off the hook, he struck a deal with the CIA and with the office of, of Vice President Dick Cheney to start providing former uh, US soldiers and sailors and Marines uh, to the government to be used in discrete military operations. So the first contract, and, and the reason for this, and, and I was, as I was talking to John about this, when, when you, once you leave active duty, and, and you are a very skilled warrior or a skilled operator, and you've been at tier one or tier two at the tip of the spear in these US wars, you have a skill set that does not translate very well back in the United States. What are you gonna do? Because you've spent, you spent all this time training, and what you're good at is something that we don't do a lot of inside of the United States. And what you, what you are trained to do, what your whole reason for being has become, what your identity is all of a sudden meaningless in a way once you're back here. And what, I mean, what do you want to do? You want to be a guard somewhere? You, know, you, you want to be a rent-a-cop? You want to, no. I mean, if you want to continue being a soldier, you look for other ways to be a soldier. The first contract that Blackwater got was with the CIA to go into Afghanistan in the early stages of US operations there. 
And what the job was is that the, the Blackwater guys, almost all of them were former Navy SEALs, they went in and they were guarding a, a, a CIA covert base along the Afghan-Pakistan border that was called the Alamo. And, and so Eric Prince, the owner of the company, actually goes over to Afghanistan with this team of Navy SEALs. And he um, spends two weeks with his guys on the ground guarding the CIA. It was a very, very dangerous time in that war. It was the time when, it, when the, there was actual serious, serious fighting going on in a clandestine way. But then he goes, he, he leaves this, this place, he goes to Kabul, Afghanistan, to the capital, and he starts cutting other deals with the State Department as it started to get on the ground there, and the DOD, and starts to really kind of work, wax the wheels. Um, and so when, when, uh, when the Bush administration realized that this guy, Eric Prince, could get all these amazing veterans to sign back up uh, to serve in these wars, they said, let's do it. And it made a lot of sense for them because these guys aren't wearing uniform anymore. We don't really need to report what they're doing to Congress. They're kind of the ultimate machine for what, what we want to do. They're very seasoned warriors. They're tier one operators. They're not, they don't have to operate in the chain of command anymore. They can effectively be a kind of paramilitary wing of the White House. And, and that's, that's, that's what Blackwater became, 2001, 2002. Then 2003 rolls along and the US invades Iraq. When Paul Bremer was sent there to be the viceroy of Iraq, he wasn't guarded by Marines. He wasn't guarded by US military, other US military forces. He was guarded by a private company. He was guarded by Blackwater. Blackwater had cornered the market on executive protection. They would make the, the, the bodyguards for Lady Gaga look like you know, a rent-a-cop at Walmart. I mean, they, they were the best of the best. I always say about Blackwater, they weren't the biggest, they weren't the most profitable, but they, they were the most elite. They were like a high-end boutique on a strip full of targets, you know. Uh, and, and, and so Paul Bremer is guarded by these Blackwater guys. And if you think about the logic of it, it fit perfectly into the neoconservative mindset, this sort of gospel of the free market. Because if the military was guarding Paul Bremer and he got killed, A, it's war. That happens. And no one would have been like, well, the U.S. military is terrible and the U.S. military can't keep people alive. That's a, it's a war zone and people understand that you die in a war zone. But if you're a private company and your only business is keeping people alive, and the first pub big public contract you get to guard the US man in Iraq, he gets bumped off. What are you gonna to say to the next person that comes here? Oh, I'm sorry that Ambassador Bremer got killed, but we'll do better with you. So he literally put his life in the, in the, uh, in the hands of the almighty free market, and, and in a way it kind of worked. And, and Blackwater never lost anyone under their protection in Iraq. But what they did was they killed a tremendous number of civilians because their job was, want, was, was single keep those people alive by any means necessary. That meant anyone around you is an enemy, is a potential suicide bomber. And if you need to shoot up a car full of women and kids, you shoot that car up if it comes too close to you. It doesn't matter who's in it because your only job is to keep alive the most important people in Iraq who aren't Iraqis, but are American officials that are in Iraq. And that was the formula they created. Their rules of, <coughs> of engagement, they don't even call them rules of engagement, they call them uh, rules for the use of force, are different than those that are, um, are assigned to US soldiers when they're there. US soldiers have, have a totally different set of rules for engagement. The Blackwater guys could shoot much quicker than, than uh, a soldier in the military would have been able to. But what we also found out was that when they would actually kill civilians, sometimes in an intentional way, uh, as we've learned from US military investigations and FBI investigations, they were not held to the same standard that US soldiers would be held to if they did the same thing. US soldiers are bound by the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and there have been scores of prosecutions for murder uh, of US soldiers and for other crimes. And I, I think many people who've been in combat in Iraq probably know someone who either has been threatened with, with, with an Article 32 proceeding or a court-martial, or have, have actually been court-martialed for something or another that they did in Iraq. I don't want to get into this story, but there's the recent way that this manifested itself is these kill team photos, as they're called, that were recently published. You know, the, 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 there, are, there are prosecutions that are happening for US soldiers that have committed these kinds of acts. The private forces, they don't get prosecuted, and they don't get prosecuted effectively. When I met with the US military investigators who investigated a massacre of 17 Iraqis in Baghdad's Nisar Square in 2007, when Blackwater forces opened up on it, the, the colonel who, uh, the Marine colonel who investigated that massacre told me that if US Marines had done that exact same thing with all the same circumstances, they all would have been 
court-martialed on murder charges. And yet these guys have walked away <coughs> scot-free from doing something that US soldiers would have been court-martialed for doing. What, what, does that, what does that say to people who wear the uniform in the United States, who, who have the flag on their shoulder and go over to these war zones, when these guys are paid $180,000 a year or six fifty dollars a day? And I don't know what the current, current combat pay is for someone who's in Afghanistan or Iraq, but it's not, it's not $180,000. What does it say about a country that values the bodyguards for Ambassador Paul Bremer more than the general commanding that war? The individual bodyguards guarding Paul Bremer in Iraq made more than the US general commanding the war at the time. Is it a coincidence that Blackwater poured money into the Bush-Cheney campaign, gives money to all these congressional campaigns, was a, was a sort of leader within the Republican movement financially? I used to think that was a definite yes. But you know what? The Democrats are doing it too. Obama has doubled the number of private contractors in Afghanistan. In Iraq right now, we have a US embassy that's the size of Vatican City. The Vatican has embassies around the world. We have an embassy that's the size of the Vatican. You know, it's the size of 80 football fields. And, 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 it, and you have all these people that are gonna be there as part of our diplomatic surge that are going to need security. And you know who guards them? Private security companies like Blackwater, DynCor, Triple Canopy. You know who guards the US ambassador in Afghanistan right now? Blackwater guards the US ambassador in Afghanistan right now. There are, there are private security companies that are growing at an exponential rate because the US is under President Obama continuing this radical outsourcing of security functions. Blackwater also works globally right now for the Central Intelligence Agency all around the world guarding its operatives. When forward operating base uh, Chapman was blown up uh, about a year and a half ago, eight CIA agents were reported to have been killed, but very few people know that two of those people were actually Blackwater bodyguards that were with them. And what they were doing was meeting with someone who was identified as the golden goose of intelligence, who had reportedly just met with Al-Qaeda's number two man, Ayman al-Zawakri. And, 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 and of the eight people that were there present to be killed by the suicide bomber that blew himself up, two of them were Blackwater. That's how central they are, this is under Obama, how central they are to US national security policy, that they are in the room with someone that has been identified as perhaps the single most important intelligence source to come forward since 9-11. And it was a disaster, he wasn't, he had lied and he blew himself up. But the point is that these private forces have access to the most sensitive intelligence that the US produces on a daily basis and they do that for the government and simultaneously for other governments around the world and for, other, and for corporations. Where does the loyalty lie? You know what, that, that's, that's, that's the thing about being a mercenary. At the end of the day, you can walk away from a job you're not gonna get court-martialed for walking off. You might not get that last paycheck, but nothing's gonna happen to you. And there's no rule that says you have to be, put your country before a company. And so what's to stop companies like this once they grow to have forces the size of a small nation state's military when they're simultaneously working for China and the United States? What if North Korea wants to hire them? What if, what if, uh, what if certain wealthy individuals that are financing Al-Qaeda suicide bomb plots want to hire some of these individuals. What's, what's to stop that from happening? You see, the, the scandal here, we talk about the, the intelligence failures in this country, is that 70% of the combined budget of the 16 intelligence agencies in the US, 70% of that budget is used to hire private contractors. Top security clearances are given to all sorts of people that work for for-profit companies. They have access to information that used to be the sovereign realm of the CIA or the Defense Intelligence Agency. What we've done is we have totally taken away the nation state monopoly on the use of organized violence and have allowed, in fact, supported the creation of companies that could take down a small national military. This is going to come back to haunt us at some point. The money that we've spent, that we've transferred to the private sector, the firepower that they've built up, the reach that they've, built, that they've built up. You could argue that they're chiseling away at our national security by taking this intelligence and making it for profit, taking their access to the centers of power in the United States and putting it on the, on the open market for bidding to the highest bidder.